Welcome to the fourth episode of the Turf Talk Podcast presented by Viner Consulting. This is your host, Jason the Intern Viner. And your co-host, Jordan Viner. And today on the Turf Talk Podcast, we will be giving you an overview of the Maryland football roster. Then we will talk about the first two games of the Turf's football season, Maryland at Texas and Maryland versus Towson. Yep, we're really excited to begin our football season preview, which will last from today until the football season starts in six weeks. So without further ado, we'll kick it off with two very interesting games. We'll start with T, Texas, and Towson. So first I would like to say that the Terps have a top 10 strength of schedule that has been ranked as high as number one. And that's going to be tough for a team that lost leaders like Perry Hills, Michael Dunn, Will Likely, and Roman Braglio. Yeah, the roster looks a bit depleted this season, but as we all know, Maryland football recruiting really picked up this year. So while we may have a bit of a rough year this year, I think we're going to go somewhere on 4-8. and eight. I think the future for Maryland football still looks bright. See, I think the Terps have a real chance to get to 6-6 six and six and make the postseason again. I think they start off with three winnable games, four winnable games, and then you can find two wins when you play teams like Northwestern, Indiana, and Rutgers, you're going to have to find a way to win two of those games. All right, well, well without further ado, further ado, excuse me, we have a full slate on today's podcast. We'll also be introducing a new thing, a modification to the shot clock. Instead of being 10 minutes set, it's going to be a flex shot clock. So the first segment, the Maryland roster breakdown, will last 15 minutes and starts now. So we're going to start it off with the lifeblood of the team, the quarterback position, which is a little bit up in the air for the upcoming season. You have three contenders, Caleb Henderson, Tyrell Pigrome, and Max Bortenschlager. <laughs> Max Bortenschlager is my favorite name in Maryland football history, but I do think Caleb Henderson is currently, you could call him the incumbent. He is set to start, according to the coaching staff and many of the fans. He definitely seems like he has the most talent. He was a four-star recruit that kind of got played over throughout his career, but he's at Maryland now, and he looks like the first man on the roster. So Caleb Henderson is known as a gunslinger. He went to Lake Braddock in Virginia, and he, in his years at North Carolina, he started off when Marquise Williams, who was a really good quarterback there, was the starter. Then the second pick of this last draft, Mitchell Trubinsky, and that is when he decided to make the move to be to go back home to the DMV to Maryland, but he's really known as a gunslinger type, and I think that will benefit a lot with the weaker receiving core that the Terps have, is having a quarterback that has the arm to really spread the ball around. Well, as we're going to go through on the roster here, the quarterback is the biggest question mark in the Maryland roster, in that we have three guys, and yeah, I know Tyrone Pagrom played a little bit last year, but... We don't know much about any of these guys for real. We know that they all are talented and can possibly do g- great things. We don't know if they're going to. We don't know if they're going to mature. We don't know how their progression will go. And it'll be really interesting to see with the way the receiving core is going, how it's going to work out. So let's move on to running back. And this is probably the Terps' strongest spot on the whole roster. You have... Ty Johnson, Lorenzo Harrison, Anthony McFarlane, and Jake Funk. Those are four running backs that could play for the Terps this season. And it's obviously going to be led by the two explosive guys, Ty Johnson and Lorenzo Harrison. Well, Ty Johnson had a great season last year. He broke 1,000 yards rushing for the first time since Darrell Scott did way back in 2010. And Lorenzo Harrison also adds a lot of speed to the roster. So it'll be interesting to see how McFarlane and Jake Funk mix in here. I think with Funk, they're going to try and split him out to a wing-back position where he can play receiver or running back. McFarland, I think they're going to mix into the running mix. I think with him being one of the highest-rated, if not the highest-rated Terp recruit from the last cycle, they're going to look for him to bring immediate value to Maryland football. So, moving on to the wide receivers, this is... It's a tough spot for the Terps. They got one certain guy being DJ Moore... Then they got a mix of some more slot-like receivers in Tavon Jacobs, Jaquiel Vey. Yeah, the receivers is one of, if not the weakest, one of the weakest areas on the field for Maryland. DJ Moore, as we know, is a strong playmaker. He's a good player. But after that, you really don't know what's up. You have DJ Turner, who we think is good, but we don't know. 
you have Tavon Jacobs, who we know is a good slot receiver, but has had very severe issues with injuries throughout his career. And you know, we really hope it evens out, but if it doesn't, it's not going to be a big surprise. And then you get into players you really don't know much about. Jarvis Davenport, you got the returner, Jaquiel Vey. And after that, it really drops off. Probably going to be Chris Jones, a senior transfer, but after, you don't know much about these guys. So, Jaquiel Vey started his career off at, with the Terps, then went to Towson, and now he's back for his last season of eligibility with Maryland. And Jordan has a quite interesting memory of Jaquiel Vey. So Jaquiel Vey, for me, will always be the guy who fumbled on the, on, the, on the last drive of the Boston College game. So this is an older game, 2013. Jaquiel Vey fumbled the ball inside Maryland's 20 when they were positioned to kick field goal to win the game. And then Boston, College, Boston College's star Andre Williams broke out a 40-yard run to set Boston College for a long field goal, which the Boston College team missed. But it turned out Ren Yetzel called timeout, so they got to try it again, and they made it, and Maryland lost their last ACC game, in my opinion, perfect fashion. Yeah, that, that game, you know, Andre Williams stiff-arming one of the Maryland defensive backs. It's like a Boston College like, legendary photo. So, yeah, there's a lot of bad things that happened for Maryland in that game. And now you're moving on to another strong spot for the Terps in the offensive line, or what we finally hope to be. These four-star guys that we've seen on the line, Derwin Gray, Damian Prince, and Terrence Davis, I'm hoping that they finally develop into Big Ten offensive linemen. You know, you see a lot of consistency here for the first time in years with, a, with an offensive center like Brandon Moore, who's been the leader of the Terps offensive line. But then you got a developed player in the left guard position. And who was that, Jordan? That would be Sean Christie, and that is true, that consistency matters a lot in offense, especially the offensive line, and this offensive line has been together for a while now. Sean Christie, Brendan Moore, as you said, Damian Prince, <laughs> and Sean Gray all bring very consi- consistent sets to the line, and hopefully they'll finally develop into a star offensive line, as you say. So here's an interesting fact about Sean Christie. He's developed over time, but last season, you know what he did? You know what he did? He had a kickoff return. Because on the kick return, Maryland placed some offensive linemen, and there was a short kick that Sean Christie picked up, and it really got the bench hyped up when Sean Christie had a decent kickoff return. Well, that's certainly something. That's different. I'll win at Maryland. So the last position we're going to kind of blow over here is tight end. Because in Walt Bell's offense, tight end is not used very much, except for blocking, which brings up the two tight ends we have on the roster. Number one is Avery Edwards. Now, Avery Edwards is a receiving tight end. North Carolina guy, he maybe flexed out as wide receiver, as a big wide receiver, more than actual being a tight end. And the other one is Derek Hayward. Derek Hayward is more of a blocker. He's more of an extra offensive lineman. So it'll be very interesting to see how, or if at all, Walt Bell uses them as receivers. So that's it for offense. We're going to transition to the defensive side of the ball now. And what better way to start with defensive linemen, specifically one who played offense last year, Andrew Isaacs. So after injuries and being considered as more of a blocking tight end when Maryland doesn't really use multiple tight ends at once, Andrew Isaacs decided that it was time for him to move to the defensive line where he will look to develop there. So we're going to start it off with Maryland's set on defense, which is an Andy Boo thing that really is not very common. Maryland uses a very interesting system known as the 4-2-5. Now, I, I'll be admitted, I don't really understand it, so I'm basically explain, explain it here. So, if you start off with the 4, where the Terps play three down defensive linemen and a stand-up rusher, kind of like Sean Merriman used to do back in the day for the Terp fans. The stand-up rusher in this is the star of the Terps' defense. It will be Jesse Annie Bodum. You know, he, I saw him featured on one of the most advanced stat sites for college football where it said that he has some of the most sacks on third down. He will be playing the stand-up rusher. Then the two down defensive linemen are projected. Both redshirt seniors, Savon Walker, will be playing the defensive tackle position, and Kingsley Opara, the nose tackle position, and then on the other side, they call him the anchor, it's used to, it, last year was played by Roman Braglio, this year they're looking for it to be played by Chandler Burkett, 
And then the Terps have two linebackers, and there's an interesting situation going on here. Jordan, tell us about it. So, well, the linebacker position is a bit shaky. Now, number the first linebacker will absolutely be Jermaine Carter Jr., arguably the best player on the defense. And then it gets a bit iffy, because it would be Shane Cockrell. But as some of you don't know, Shane Cockrell was declared academically ineligible for this quick lane bowl last season and has not yet regained his eligibility. So it is very possible that he will not suit up in his last year. So that kind of opens up the position a little bit. The two competitors for the spot will be Jalen Brooks and Isaiah Davis. So Isaiah Davis brings a lot more flexibility. He's only a sophomore. He's a little bit younger, but he's really fast. He's a very athletic player. He definitely brings a lot more flexibility to the defensive core. See, I found Maryland linebackers last season... You have the same guys taking every snap, and I didn't, I didn't like that a lot. And they were both they got slow by the end of the game. I think this year they're going to mix in a lot of guys. I think Isaiah Davis is a good guy in the mix. I also think they're going to be able to use Jalen Brooks a little bit more. But now we move into a spot where there's, I would say, a lot of uncertainty for the Terps, possibly the worst spot on the roster, and that is the defensive backfield. Well. I don't know if it's poetic justice or not, but it's interesting that the best, the worst positions on offense is wide receiver, and the worst on defense is defensive back. So, defensive backfield is a bit, it's a bit inexperienced this year. The safeties aren't, though. Denzel Conyers is a retro senior, and Darnell Savage is also, is not a retro senior, he's a junior, excuse me. Those two are very talented, they are good, they have experience, but they're in my opinion, the defensive backfield is only as good as the cornerbacks. And that is where Maryland feels dreadfully short. Tino Ellis and J.C. Jackson are projected to start at the 1-2 and two cornerback slots. But both of them... Are- so, Mason, what are your expectations for the cornerbacks? So, I'm looking for J.C. Jackson, who we were told by us, many Maryland sources, including Turf Talk, that he had an NFL-level body size and talent. I'm looking for him to get to that point in his career and really step it up and become the number one corner on this team. From Tino Ellis, I'm looking for development. He came to Maryland really to play with receiver, ended up at DB, and here's a key player for the Maryland defensive backfield. Marquise Bell was such a highly rated recruit, committed to the Terps during the Under Armour All-American football game, and I'm looking for him to step up somewhere. I remember DJ Durkin said he's a player that can go from linebacker to cornerback to safety, I'm looking for him to step up in this defensive backfield. Well, another defensive quarterback member is Ravon Davis, a junior. It's just, they all go in into the same category, which is someone who needs to step up. Someone has to be a difference maker, because if they don't, the defense will struggle as a whole. Cornerbacks need to be able to hold down receivers. And Maryland struggled to do that a little bit last year, especially after Will Likely got hurt. And let's hope they can improve this year. If they can't, it might be a long season. Yeah, Rayvon Davis is the listed as the nickel in the 4-2-5. So, I'm going to touch on special teams here for a minute. Wade Lees, the Maryland punter, he's been named to the punter of the year watch list. And at kicker, there's a little bit of uncertainty. You know, Adam Green played last year. He wasn't really that good. Matt Shinsky got a few kicks at the end of the year. There might be a kicker competition in College Park, Jordan. This goes back to something I was saying earlier, which is I feel like special teams really dropped off in Maryland. Now we used to be really good at this, as for some of you remember. We know we had Adam Poblis, Travis Bolts, and Punter. These guys were good. They played for a long time in Maryland. We haven't really gotten that since. So we're running out of time here. So Mason, I'll let you have the final thought time. Look for the Terps to use this season to build something great. For the future. Because this team is young. While there are veteran parts, there are also a lot of young pieces going into the year. Maryland's going to mix a lot of guys. We didn't mention guys like Melvin Kane and Brayon and Brennan Gaddy that could be big contributors on the defensive line. Because you don't really know. DJ Durkin likes mixing it up with freshmen. And you're still going to see that this season. Alright, now about to take us down to the end of the shot clock here. So Mason, tell us about the Turk Talk YouTube page. So the Terp Talk YouTube page is also known as Wayne Terp on YouTube. Most recent video is from the Bayhawks celebration of the Maryland Lacrosse National Championship, 
We had Ethan Minster and Bryce Young on the Terp Talk YouTube page. Check out that interview at Wayne Terp on YouTube. So now let's get into week one of our first of 12 Maryland football game previews, and that is Maryland at Texas. So this game has been the calendar for, if you can believe this, seven years now. So um, this game was scheduled, Texas was ranked number four in the country, and Maryland had just lost 38-16 to Temple. So you're looking at a team in Texas that has now has Todd Herman as their coach. Last season they had Charlie Strong as their coach. That is such a big offensive and defensive change. To get a new coach, and it's a completely new system and philosophy. Todd Herman at Big 12 Media Days talked about how Texas cannot lose anymore. It can't become Texas, Texas's normalcy to lose. That's all that he talked about. Charlie Strong, on the other hand, had some intensity issues, getting practices and game days intense enough as the players felt for them to win. Yeah, and that's a big culture change, and I think that's the thing with Texas this year, is can Texas become Texas again? Can the culture change that Todd Herman is going to bring create a winning ideal? Can they start winning again? And that's why this game is going to be so big for Texas. Texas is going to look at this game as being the Todd Herman era. And I do think Todd Herman is the right guy for Texas. He went to Texas. He was a GA Texas. Texas is his dream job. And that is going to show the football field, I think, in week one. I think Texas is going to bring the intensity. I don't know if the Terps can handle it. So you're talking about this intensity, and intensity is not everything. Todd Herman runs an offense that's going to be really complicated for the young quarterback, Shane Bouchel. And it's going to be really tough for the receivers to react to it because it's such a change. Todd Herman runs an offense based on areas, not routes for the receivers. It's based on getting to an open space in your selected area. So that is really hard for the quarterback to read and for the receivers. This is a very new offensive idea and system. We saw it, Maryland actually saw it a few years ago when it was really, really new. When they lost to Bowling Green in 2015 against Dino Babbers. And this system is hard to cover if run well. So that, I almost feel like that's the X factor in the game, is if Texas's offense can pick up the system. Because if they can, then Maryland's defensive backfield, as we just talked about, isn't very good. I don't know if they're going to be able to keep up with them. Look, this is such a hard set, as I just said. Texas has to get it down by week one. It's really hard to get this system really moving till you play a game against a defense that hasn't seen it this crazy amount of times that they practice these plays, it's going to be hard for Texas, especially a quarterback in Shane Bouchelle, to really get it down. He is now taking the reins by himself. They had a senior quarterback last year named Tyrone Swoops that played a little bit of the snaps, so it's all up to him now in an offense that expects him to do a lot of work. Well, Texas lost a lot of output last year, too. Their big one was they lost Dante Foreman. Dante Foreman ran for 2,028 yards last year. That is a lot. So that's going to hurt Texas, and it may actually help Maryland a lot. They really struggled against the run against superiorly talented teams, which I'm going to consider Texas, last year. And it's very... I'm not saying it's going to be impossible for Maryland to win. I actually think there's a pretty good chance, but I just feel like Texas is going to want it more. Okay, never say that about a DJ Durkin coach team, that the other team wants it more. That is not going to be the problem. I refuse to say that this man, he's such a powerful coach. He is such a good leader. They want to win, and they want to win now. So the Terps are going to bring it. You know, they're pumped up for this year. You know that. So when talking about that, you're talking about them playing a defense that doesn't have the best statistical numbers ever. They were ranked 90th in total defense from 2016. So they're going to have problems stopping Lorenzo Harrison and Ty Johnson. They were also ranked 101st in pass defense. So if Caleb Henderson is the choice, as we projected earlier, he's going to have a lot of room to spread the ball around against not that good of a pass defense. Okay, I'm going to correct myself back there. I didn't mean that D.J. Durkin's team didn't want it. I just mean that Texas is really going to want to win this game, and they are a more talented team. That has not been a problem for the Turfs in the past. In 2015, they beat Michigan and Penn State, both of which 
person like you would consider superior talented teams that were both in that 6-6 six and six range that this Texas team was in last season. Maryland has proven they can beat teams that have superior talent when they beat these Michigans and Penn States. That, that is not the only reason why this game, why Texas win this game. They also come out with an offense that might be really tough for the Terps' defensive backfield to stop. Well, here's the thing, though. Texas, I don't think they're... First off, those games against Michigan and Penn State were two years ago now. The team is radically different. And Maryland really, really struggled against Superior. They really struggled in the Randy Etzel era. They lost 63 to nothing to Florida State. Uh, they lost big games over and over and over again. But in those two times, with teams that were struggling, they were able to overcome the superior talent clause that you're bringing up. And win the game. But that was two years ago. Last year, they struggled horrifically against superiorly talented teams. They averaged less than two yards per carry on the strongest part of the team, which is the running backs. They just don't play up well. Well, this spot is interesting. I see them in the Michigan State realm. Maryland was able to beat Michigan State, another of your superior talent clause teams. And Texas is in that spot right now. They're in that question mark, they don't know what's going on spot where their offense is taking on a completely new concept and their defense has struggled a lot over the past couple of years. All right, well, we're running out of time the shot clock here. So I guess I'll say my final thoughts since you seem to kind of have said yours. I think Maryland can win this game. I don't think they will. I think Texas is going to be fast and furious in their first game, and I think it's going... I don't think we're going to win the game. That's basically all I'm going to say. I think it's going to be really close. I think there's room to win, but I don't think it's going to happen. I have 35-31 as the score. I got 42-35 Terps. I think Shane Bouchel and the Texas offense can get it rolling, but I think Caleb Henderson and the Maryland run game is really going to go explode throughout the game and just going to just get the slightest edge and win this game. So moving on to a shorter segment here on the Terp Talk podcast, but first... Remember to listen to Bruce Posner on the Sports Maven, 9 a.m. CBS 1300 Radio in Baltimore, or on the Radio.com app. He'll be talking about the O's and the Terps. And just check in to Bruce, 9 a.m. 1300 on the Sports Maven. Listen on the Radio.com app. So, Jordan, talking about week two here, Maryland and Towson. And you've kind of turned into an FCS guru in the past few years. And Towson made the FCS championship a few years ago, but ever since then, it's been kind of downhill. Yeah, well, a lot of people will remember the FCS t- near title run they had in 2013, and that really has been the peak of Towson football. They've had a, a coach the last few years, Rob Ambrose, who is actually a disciple of Ren Yedsel. He was a co- he was under Ren Yedsel from 2002 to 2008, and then he moved to Towson, actually before Maryland before Randy moved to Maryland, and he has seemed to have kind of lost his touch recently. They've not been very good for a while. They were 4-7 and seven last season. Now, keep in mind, they do play in the CAA, which is one of the best conferences in the FCS, but that doesn't excuse the fact that they've lost a lot recently. He has a losing record as a coach, and Towson seems to be kind of spiraling the last two years. So a lot of this, when I was reading about this, has been chalked up to injury, but as we've seen in the past, Injury can only get a coach so much time before they get fired. And is it coming down to that with Rob Ambrose? I know he's brought them a lot of success that they really didn't have before he came. But is it getting down to the end of the line for Rob Ambrose? Well, this is something that I didn't know until I did more research. Towson football, or excuse me, Rob Ambrose, has only been in the playoffs twice. Now, one of those times he won three games. The other time he lost in the first round. So maybe it is the end of... Rob Ambrose's run, but this is a Maryland podcast, so let's get back to Towson. They run a volume run-based offense, which means they run the ball a lot. Yeah, when we were looking at the numbers, they had three guys last season that took over 70 carries, a lot of them near 1,000 yards. It's a power, not really power run team, it's a volume run team. They like handing the ball off a lot. Their quarterback, Ellis Hudson, was hurt part of the season last year. And they're losing a lot of production also at the receiver position where they're losing their two top guys. They, uh, unfortunately, Towson... No, F- FCS did really well against FBS last year. I made some news that the FCS seems 
to be catching up in terms of talent. But this is not one of those world-beating FCS teams that's going to pull an upset, I don't think. They just don't seem to have their magic touch anymore. And I don't know. I feel bad for Towson. I really like them. I always saw them as a Maryland State type thing. But they seem to have lost it. And I think this game's going to be a blowout. I got 52-3 Maryland. So you touched on the Maryland State thing. This should be a rivalry game. It should be. It should be Maryland versus Maryland State. But Towson just isn't there as a team yet. And really, they lost a lot last season. They struggled to score. They really needed to hold the other team to under 24 points to win last season. You got them at about 4-7 and seven this year. And it really seems to be a struggling program at the moment. I, personally, would just say whatever the betting line is, Lay the points on Towson and take the turfs and also take the over. That's just, that's my prediction for this one. <laughs> Alright, well, that'll wrap up this extremely short segment. Well, now that we have some extra time, we can talk about our pro sports segment of the day, which is the very, very recently signed John Wall Sewer Max contract. John Wall will receive four years, $170 million, and this is the kicker here, starting in 2019, which means he's under contract in D.C. to 2023 now. So John Wall just signed this contract, and he's not even close to what James Harden is making. But right now, if you looked at the current Wizards contract numbers, John Wall would be making close to what Otto Porter and Bradley Beal are making combined. That is not. Which seems to me to be absolutely ridiculous, because I would rather have a mix of Otto Porter and Bradley Beal than John Wall. That's not true for me. John Wall is an NBA superstar. Those are on short supply these days. And I think that this is good for the Wizards because superstars are so f- hard to find. Also, this is a very important thing that not many people are going to talk about. It takes off the pressure for the Wizards to make a move to make him want to resign. So people were talking about LaMarcus Aldrich possibly coming to the Wizards because it would also because it would make John Wall want to stay. It would show the Wizards that they're co- excuse me, show John Wall that the Wizards are committed to winning. So that pressure is off now and. I think this is good for the Wizards. So, you just talked about LaMarcus Aldridge, and if Kyrie, who is now demanded to trade, moves to the Western Conference, should the Wizards immediately add LaMarcus Aldridge to make them contenders? Well, this is going to a rumor that's surfaced in the last few days, that Wizards are going to trade Markeith Morris, Gortat, and a 2018 pick for LaMarcus Aldridge. Doesn't seem entirely balanced to me, but it's a win-now move, and it's... It's hard to say, honestly. If if Kyrie leaves the Cavs, they become much weaker, and it's very possible to see the Wizards possibly being an actual contender. But I don't know. It's hard to say. The Eastern Conference is in a very weird spot right now. That's what I'm going to say. So you have a lot of up-and-coming teams in the Eastern Conference, but that would make push the Wizards to the forefront of the Eastern Conference. You know, it's really hard to be better than playoff LeBron, but maybe the Wizards at that point, you could make a case to be better than LeBron and Kevin Love. And that's my final thought on this one. The Wizards, I think, should make that move. Well, we don't know if the Spurs are interested yet, but if they are, it could happen. So we're interested in a new feature on the podcast starting right now. Mason, tell us about it. So we're going to make a poll that you can vote on on TerpTalk.com that will be either one wrapping up this week's podcast and one that will, we will talk about the results f- on next week's podcast. And for this week, we're going to take your game predictions on the first two games that we have discussed, Maryland versus Taos- Towson and Maryland at Texas. And for next week, I want to hear what you guys are going to th- think is going to happen in the next two games, which is Maryland versus UCF and Maryland at Minnesota. And we're actually going to throw another wild card poll in there. Who do you think the Terps starting quarterback will be come this fall? And that's going to wrap it up for the this edition of the Terp Talk Podcast. Thanks for listening. I can make your hands clap. I can make your hands clap.